From mind flayers, demons, and devils, all the way to experiments gone wrong, it's no secret that Baldur's Gate 3 has a crazy amount of choices, paths you can go down, and different solutions to the same problems. It goes without saying that there are some things that you're just not going to find, especially on your first playthrough as you learn the ropes and get swept up into the world of Faerun. I personally missed out on several things my first playthrough, so I speak from experience on that one. Today we're going to be going over my top 9 things to not miss in Act 1 of Baldur's Gate 3. As we get started here, do note that there are some spoilers. I tried to keep things vague as far as story spoilers, however some things in and of themselves are spoilers in their very nature just by me telling you. But let's get started with the very intro of the game. In the Nautiloid intro dungeon, you will run into a few companions here that will help you escape the besieged Mind Flayer ship. Before you enter the control room, make sure you switch one of Shadowheart's spells to Command. And if you have it also on your class, take it as well. Once you head inside the control room, a Mind Flayer will be dueling with Commander Zulk, who wields a flaming greatsword known as the Everburn Blade. Get one of your characters up close, ready to pick up the weapon, and then use Shadow Heart to cast Command Drop. There's a pretty low chance, even on Balanced, but you can increase the chance if you manage to connect with a Pommel Strike from Lazelle as it can daze them, granting disadvantage on Wisdom saves. With some luck, you can get it dropped and pick it up so he's unarmed, and you now have an awesome weapon that will help you cruise through Act 1 in style. Just make sure you move it to your character's inventory before you hit the console, so you have it right after the tutorial. Of note, this is about the only way to easily kill the commander, which is an achievement. I personally did it in a four-player party, and it was pretty down to the wire, so exercise caution if you do go for that achievement. If you do go for the kill, definitely be sure to not run too far up, or more enemies will spawn in near the transponder. The Everburn Blade is a two-handed greatsword that deals 2d6 plus your strength modifier of damage and 1d4 additional fire damage, and comes with the Pommel Strike, Cleave, and lacerate weapon actions as all great swords do. Landing next in the grove, we've got a couple of things to cover. When you arrive in the grove, you can make your way up onto this ledge in the east area of the grove to meet Alfira, a tiefling bard who is performing for some squirrels. During the conversation, she will say that she has another loot that you can play with her. Take her up on the offer, and by doing so and passing a performance check, you will gain proficiency with musical instruments. I failed the first one in one example, but passed on the second one and still gained the proficiency. You'll also gain a loot. Now you can perform in style to have fun, help distract people, or just earn some gold for the busker achievement. I actually just learned this while filming for this video. Even after 200 hours, there's still things for me to learn. I'm loving that and hating it at the same time. Once you meet with Kaga the first time and deal with the Arabella situation however you see fit, there's some things to learn about her. Dip into this room to the northwest, the servants' quarters. If you hold Alt, you can see that there's a chest labeled as Kaga's chest behind here. Head back and lockpick it to find a book about shadow druids and a note to Kaga from someone named Oladon to meet them by the Swamp Docks tree. Once you're ready, head southeast to the corner of the swamp and make a few jumps over towards this island with an old, massive tree on it. There is a combat encounter here, and once you clear it, you'll be able to loot this hollowed out portion of the tree, which contains some more evidence as to what Kaga's shrouded motives may be with her position in the grove, and the Rite of Thorns. If you walk past the jail, you'll find the next two somewhat hidden things. First is a perception check that will show you a hidden passageway where there is some loot to be had and some sneaky goblins who have attacked a druid who is now in need of saving by the name of Findal. The next is further past that, a back entrance to the locked and illegal to open storage room. This is a safe way for you good characters to get in here, and here you will find the tiefling woman named Padirna on the ground unable to move due to a bad potion she drank. With a spell like Lesser Restoration, you can help her walk and get her back on her feet and not have to worry about getting caught lockpicking your way in illegally. Before we head on to the Blighted Village, I recommend a pit stop. Along the path, you'll overhear some people arguing, and one way or another, once you handle this interaction, you'll want to get the broken spear shaft off of the body of the man on the ground. After that, proceed down and across this river to the Owlbear Cave. Once inside, You'll find the owl bear responsible for the fate of the man with the broken spear, and the owl bear has the spearhead lodged inside of it still. At this point, you can either continue on with your life, not murdering the owl bear, or become part of the circle of life and kill the owl bear. If you choose to safely leave after encountering it, the next time you long rest, the owl bear will have been hunted down by someone else. At this point, you can safely grab the spearhead from it, as well as the owl bear egg in the nest. The egg can be eaten for 40 camp supplies or sold for a lot of gold. However, 
I recommend saving it for a quest a little later in Act 1. Just be sure if you want to save it, you don't accidentally auto-consume it as camp supply the next time you long rest. Once you have the spearhead, you can right-click to combine, and it will open up a dialog. Grab the other part of the spear from your inventory and click Combine, and you'll get an awesome spear which grants you bonus damage to enemies with more than two eyes, as well as has a chance of blinding foes. Really great thing to have in Act 1, and also just a really cool thing that Larian added magical items like this for us to hunt down and reconstruct. Next up, we have two different spots that are both needed for the same end result. In the main area of the Blighted Village, you'll notice a well. With a successful investigation check, or by tossing a coin down into the well, you'll come to realize it is no longer full of water. Climbing down the rope after that will bring you to a cavern. Without spoiling too much, you'll have to get through two combat encounters here in order to get a dark amethyst in the very back of this area on the ground that we're after. This gem itself doesn't do anything right now, but you will need it later. I will say the spear you can get from the previous tip is very helpful for this area. Next, go down this hatch in the apothecary building, which is right next to the blighted village waystone and you'll enter a laboratory. Behind this stack of boxes is a lever, which moves a bookcase to expose a secret passageway. You'll end up in this grove here, where there's two main things to do. First, is that there is a spell scroll of Summon Quasit in the coffin closest to the entrance here, which will get you an achievement when you use it. Next, is going around the corner and talking to this magical mirror, which, if you choose the right answers or intimidate it, will let you in. To get in on any character without any rolls, choose the following dialogue options. Zastam is a foul, wretched creature. To clean a wound, and I'd look for whatever spell will rid me of this worm in my head. Once in here, get past some traps and a locked door, and you will find a book known as the Necromancy of Thay. The dark amethyst you got previously is the key to this Necronomicon of information. You can choose to give it to someone to read, which Asterian has a keen interest in. That looks terribly heavy. Why don't you let me carry it for you? so consider giving it to him. It will grant you the ability to cast Speak with the Dead as a ritual spell, and grants a permanent passive feature increasing the character's wisdom saves and checks by one. No promises that nothing bad will happen in the short term, however. Do note that you can destroy it with radiant damage if you prefer, but not everyone may like that, and it will grant you no stat benefits. But hey, this is a role-playing game. You do you. Zipping right along, once you free Volo from the goblin camp, he will come back to your camp. Make sure you talk to him and ask him to do research into the parasite. After a long rest, he will have an option to perform an operation on you. If you are very squeamish, you may want to pass through the dialogue because it's a little iffy. If you agree, Volo will operate on you and inadvertently permanently damage one of your eyes. In response, he will give you a magical eye. This eye allows you to see invisible creatures, the only downside to this is having to sit through that awful audio, and also it does change your eye color, so if you're very fond of it, this might make you sad. Sad until you can see all these invisible bastards anyway. I will also say that the tiefling and dragonborn eyes in particular, it can be very jarring because of how over the top those eyes are compared to normal human eyes. The Festering Cove is something I didn't find until very recently. Down in the Underdark, sort of between the Arcane Tower and the Decrepit Village, is a cracked rock that you have to jump across some mushrooms to get to. Once you climb down, you'll be in an area with some Kuatoa fish people that are in the midst of a holy ritual. The choices are yours to see how it plays out. If you choose correctly, you may become something of a god to these Kuotoa. If you choose wrong, it may end up in a bloodbath. The choice is yours, but be sure not to miss this before you head on to Act 2. The very rare Staff of Morning Frost is another weapon just like the spear, but you'll need to obtain three pieces instead of two. Down in the Underdark, the icy crystal is dropped by Philaro the Forgotten, over by the Susser Tree, over here. The Icy Helve is dropped or pickpocketed from Dorne once you defeat the enemy over here near the Selenite Outpost. The third and likely final piece you will obtain is the Icy Metal, which is found on a drow's body in the Myconid Colony's vault that they will open up once you help them. Combine all three, and you'll be the new owner of the Morning Frost Staff, which adds extra cold damage to your cold damage attacks and allows any spells that you cast that deal cold damage to possibly inflict chill on your target. In addition, it grants the Ray of Frost cantrip to its wielder. So there you have it, nine things you don't want to miss in the first act of Baldur's Gate 3. I hope a few of these were things you weren't aware of, but if not, congratulations, you're an amazing explorer. I wanted to make this to help everyone see as much of this fantastic game as possible. I also made this video here 
on some awesome spoiler-free tips that will help you make sure your adventuring goes as smooth as possible. So click there, and I'll see you on the roads, fellow adventurers.